Hi. Hi, everybody. I know I'm just supposed to start right into this, but I feel weird not saying hi because you guys are all sitting in front of me. All right, let's begin. A story about a story. So, imagine for one moment that you and me and all of us in the world actually are stars in the universe and we create uh, galaxies and universes and constellations. Imagine that we're all connected and when we look around, we see this kind of beauty that you see on this screen. Now, a lot of people ask me what it feels like to be in depression. And what I often say to people is this, it feels like you are a star, yes, but instead of seeing a whole bunch of stars and being surrounded by these stars, you're surrounded by dark, vacuous, empty, endless space. And that's not the worst part about depression is feeling completely alone. It's more that you don't know when it's gonna end. You have no clue when that suffering is going to actually be relieved. And that's why a lot of people consider suicide. That was me every single day, about 12 years ago, 10 years ago. I would wake up every single morning and that was the hardest part, was the moment you wake up because sometimes in sleep you forget that you're depressed. But in reality, when you wake up, I, I would often think to myself, am I going to kill myself today? And if not, what am I going to look forward to? Oftentimes I couldn't think of anything but one. This afternoon, I'm going to eat a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> That's a good one. And this actually saved me for years. So this obsession with the chocolate chip cookie, I would sit there and eat it, and it would be a moment that I would connect back to my own body with my senses, which is so devoid when you're in the middle of depression. And this obsession with eating them led to where in the city has the best chocolate chip cookie led to let me bake all the chocolate chip cookies that I can find in the entire world, <laughs> all the recipes, <laughs> which led me to baking five layer cakes a week and se sending them off to all my friends and their waistlines were growing and they're just saying, stop sending me chocolate chip cookies. So I decided to start a farmer's ma market bakery called Yummy Baked Goods. This was a long time ago. I did this for about two years before I went to pastry school. And that was me on my very first farmer's market <laughs> bakery, baking all night and um, looking a lot nerdier than I do now <laughs> on the outside. I'm still just as nerdy on the inside. <laughs> and this obsession, this being in the kitchen, reconnecting with smells, tastes, sounds, the sound of uh, bubbling caramel, uh, all of these things actually um, made me climb out of uh, this thing called depression step by step. And eventually I decided to go to Paris to study pastry. That's me in pastry school, just as nerdy. <laughs> and eventually, as some of you guys might know, I came back to Vancouver and decided to open a little pastry shop called Boku Bakery. And at this bakery, the sole intention was to inspire with quality and care. I wanted to give somebody out there that may have been feeling as empty and lonely um, a chance to be reconnected to the living again. After all this happened, a publisher actually came to me, Penguin Random House, and they said, will you tell your story? Will you write a memoir? And I thought they were gonna ask me to write a cookbook, but they asked me to write a memoir. I don't know if they knew what they were getting themselves into. <laughs> and I said, no, no way. My story's not done, which was not true. I lied a little bit, which was so sort of true, but not really. The real reason was because I was so scared. I knew that when you wrote a memoir that was worth reading, you needed to write all the really horrible moments to, in order to make the good moments make sense. Otherwise, you're just self-aggrandizing and not being genuine. And I have this tattoo on my arm, and it was probably one of the most painful tattoos I've gotten. And I, the reason why I said no is this. When people look at this and it looks a bit faded, they say, oh, you should really go back and get that touched up. And I think to myself, hell no. 
because I remember what it felt like. I remember the pain, especially right here. It was so tender and the healing process took so long. Funny enough, I've gotten tattoos on more painful parts of my body since, but I'll never go back to this part. I was so afraid of going back to relive the moments of that depression, because in order to write it, you have to be there again. But around this time, funny enough, I was in Paris, living my best life, hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that I still, in some ways, felt so lonely. And I wondered why. And I was reading this book, um, Brene Brown's The Gifts of Imperfection. And it said in there, staying vulnerable is a risk we have to take if we want to experience connection. And what I realized is that if I didn't feel brave enough and vulnerable enough to be truly myself in the world, how could I ever expect anyone to know me enough for me to feel loved for who I am? It was a catch-22. So I realized that fear was not a good enough reason for me not to do the things that I really wanted to do, so I wrote the book. And through writing the book, actually, I came uh, to some really beautiful, unexpected uh, realizations, actually, about storytelling, which I'm going to share with you now. I won't leave you hanging. Uh, storytelling unfolds forgiveness. So I wanted to write this book with as much forgiveness for every single person involved in the story because I knew that we are just human, that none of us are pure saints, pure sinners. We're just complex beings trying to make it through life. And if I didn't tell the story in that way, it just would not have been gracious and true. But what I didn't expect was that the person I needed to forgive most in my own story was me. There were days when I could not continue, and there was one particular day I'll tell you about. I would write every single morning. I went to Central Oregon to write, and in the morning time, I just couldn't. I would put my fingertips on the keyboard. Nothing came out. So I, I would usually take a hike up to this butte uh, in Central Oregon, and I would just pray, whatever, talk to the universe, whatever you want to call it. And this morning, uh, words came to me, and what if, which sometimes it came, uh, and I would just start with those words, and words would then come out afterwards. Uh, and I went back to the cabin, and I put my fingertips onto the laptop, and I wrote, and what if, and I just started crying, bawling uncontrollably, down to the ground, on my knees, huddled, holding myself. And I didn't know why I was crying at first, but the words came out, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I realized in that moment that I needed to forgive myself for having put myself in really painful circumstances and for so long. And it wasn't until I could say to myself, I forgive you, you were just human, like everybody else. I couldn't write. And when I said that, I went back to um, the computer and I wrote the rest of that chapter, which was Tell Me I'm Beautiful. When the book finally came out, lots more unexpected stories, uh, lessons about storytelling came out. Uh, storytelling unfolds understanding. So it's funny, when we look at people from far away, they're so great. Everything about this, them is amazing. These 140 characters, uh, highlights of our lives, Instagram, their lives look so amazing. We all want to be them. However, once you get a little bit closer, just like standing in the middle of this beautiful, field of sunflowers, when you're standing in the middle of it, you start to realize you're standing in a lot of like dirt, uh, there's bugs, the stems look rotten, and you're like, oh, this is kind of gross. I don't really want to be standing here. And then when you get even closer and you st start looking at all the petals and the stamens and um, the way that the fuzz looks on the, on the leaves, you start to realize when you get close enough to someone to see all, all of them, or as much as you possibly can, they start to become really beautiful again. And this is what story t reading someone's story is like. Oftentimes we judge people on one frame of their life. We hear a story about someone and go, gosh, she cheated on her husband, or that guy's doing drugs, or whatever you want to call it, whatever you guys judge people for, or I judge people for. But what we don't understand is that's just one frame in an entire reel of someone's life. 
an entire film. We don't know where this moment is going to lead. We don't know how they're going to change the world with this experience. We don't know how they're going to redeem other people with this. And we don't know where they came from. And so it's very difficult to have understanding of someone unless they tell their story. I also realized that storytelling unfolds perspective. Uh, there's a great quote, what an, what an astonishing thing a book is. One glance at it and you're inside the mind of another person, maybe somebody dead for thousands of years, binding together people who never knew each other, citizens of distant epochs. Books break the shackles of time. And the funny thing is, I have a friend that said, um, that was in some sort of like a meeting or whatever, and they said, how would you know how this person feels? How would you know how this race, this person, this gender uh, in a different time period felt? And he said something so poignant, which is, I think I know because I read. Just like during the time when I was so depressed and I would read um, MFK Fisher, who was a food writer, her descriptions of food, of life, of hungers, not only hungers of, um, the body, but hungers of the soul, satisfied. That was the moment that I could even put myself in someone else's shoes and imagine what it would be like to live again. The next thing is that storytelling unfolds compassion. You know, we often, as human beings, like to project things onto other people because oftentimes it's a lot easier to fix someone else instead of fix ourselves, or even be happy for someone else instead of be happy for ourselves and think, to some, to think about someone else. They're so beautiful instead of owning our own beauty. Um, this happens a lot with the book, actually is that people have so much compassion for me in my story without realizing that they too are in that story and that same level of compassion should be extended to themselves and yet they find it difficult. I'll just tell you a quick story that was actually in the book. Uh, it was around the time that I was struggling um, with an eating disorder and it was also around the time that I had this farmer's market bakery and I made this multi-grain biscotti and they were in little packages and I saw this woman extremely thin, on the brink of, you know, death, if not close, pallid, gaunt, wafy, and she paced back and forth along the stall, picking up the biscotti, putting it down, tortured with the decision of whether or not to buy it and eat it. And I knew, because I had done the same thing, I knew exactly what she was thinking. What's in this? Is it safe? Is it a good food? Is it a bad food? Am I going to hate myself after I eat this? Am I going to want to throw up after I eat this? And she was so tortured. And immediately when I looked at her, I felt distinctly disgusted, appalled. All I wanted to do was look away. But then I realized she's just a reflection of me, that within me. And then I saw in her face how sad she was, how scared how she longed to be just told, you are just fine the way you are. And in that one moment, I had so much compassion for her that I was able to realize that her and I were the same, actually. And I started a seed of compassion for myself, too. Storytelling unfolds with time, too. A truly great book should be read in youth, again in maturity, and once more in old age, as a fine building should be seen by morning light at noon and by, and by moonlight. See, the thing is, one of the best lessons of storytelling that I learned was about five months after the book had come out, people had already started reading it, and I decided to go back and read the book myself, like, well, I wrote it, maybe I should just read it again. <laughs> and when I did, I realized that all of these moments that I felt so scared and so ashamed of myself were actually the moments that I was the most courageous. It wasn't moving to France, doing all these great things, opening a business, following my dreams. All of that stuff is great. Don't get me wrong. I love that I did that stuff too. However, it was in the decision that I woke, made when I woke up every single day to eat a chocolate chip cookie and not kill myself every single day for years. 
that was the most courageous, when I felt the most weak. So when I tell people at cocktail parties or whatever uh, that I wrote a memoir, their first question is, oh, well, usually they give me like a, what, you? Because they say, aren't you a little bit too young to have written a memoir? Well, my argument is this. Absolutely not. Storytelling is in the fiber of humanity. This is a picture of what they presume to be the very first cave painting. Um, what it is is just people wanting to say, hi, I'm here. This is my story. So you can be two or 80 or 90 and still have a story to tell. We read to know we're not alone. And what I want to suggest is maybe we storytell to know we're not alone too. Why don't we do it? Because it's really scary. Being vulnerable is scary. But what I've realized is that the more I tell my story, the more I accept myself and love myself exactly for who I am and have compassion for myself, the less other people's judgment actually matters to me because I know what I think of me. That's not to say that it's always safe for us to put ourselves in vulnerable situations, no, but we're smart enough to know the difference. And also, I think what makes for good storytelling is good story listening. If you can do nothing else, do whatever it is in your power to make the people in your life feel completely unashamed of who they are. This is our responsibility, I think, as human beings, because all we want is to be accepted for who we are. So why wouldn't we give that same gift to someone else standing right in front of us who needs it desperately? So my question to you is, will you guys tell your story? It's easy to come up to me and be like, hi, I can be vulnerable with you because I just wrote a book on my greatest vulnerabilities and you read it. But will you guys be vulnerable with each other? And instead of not saying the truth, and pretending you're something that you're not. Why not be exactly who you are? Because just as uh, Dr. Greenhill just said to me backstage, uh, the path is so much easier if you just directly go to exactly who you are from the beginning. <laughs> so there you go, that's it.